Okay, welcome back after lunch. Um, so we continue uh, this uh, this lecture on uh, on source sync. And so I stopped uh, in the previous uh, hour. I stopped here after having defined the sequence system struct both in marine and in uh, continental. Um, and I was just uh, this is. All of this is linked. You, you know, you, you don't have to do to do it in one sense or another. But uh, this here is a, a little drawing to explain accommodation and sedimentation and the concept that. Uh, so, so what's behind is that the relationship between those two factors. Accommodation is the space available for sedimentation. And sedimentation is how much uh, sediment you, you bring in. <clears throat> the relationship between those two uh, parameters somehow determines um, the facies and, and the long-term stratigraphic evolution of, your, uh, of the successions you are looking at. So accommodation is this distance here, okay? It's how much space there is between a level of reference at the bottom and a level of reference at the top. Above this, you cannot sediment. We hear this is in the air. Below that, it's already rock, okay? But everything in between is available space, is free. And that's accommodation, okay? So how to change accommodation? To change accommodation, you can do changes of this interface or changes of this interface, okay? This interface can be lake level, sea level, water level in a river. Okay, and so it changes with uh, many parameters. That's almost an entire uh, topic in itself. But we know that glaciation, deglaciation, I have uh, implied changes of sea level. Uh, we know that climate does that, uh, and it changes at various uh, time scales as well. The bottom interface can change due to tectonics, uplift or subsidence. Just the way of sediment itself can make the ground go down with the same philosophy as what we've uh, said yesterday, that if you erode a six kilometer of a mountain range, uh, your average elevation goes up one kilometer. It's the same thing if you add uh, sediment onto the ground, you gain some uh, some some depth. So I haven't made the calculation, but I guess if you add six kilometer of sediment, you may gain one extra kilometer to put. Um, so that's your space, and then there is sediment supply coming in. This arrow here, and depending on 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 different things, the amount of sediment coming in will generate a certain amount of sedimentation. So let's say you bring a certain amount of sediment. If it's coarse grained and your liver is not very energetic, you will, you will, you will put a lot of sedimentation locally. If it's fine grained and very energetic, you will kind of blow sediment away. And even if you bring the same quantity, you will leave little sedimentation, sedim sediment deposited. But by the end, the ratio between how much you have sp uh, space available before sedimentation and sedimentation results in some water depth here. Yeah? Or if you fill completely, it results in a certain thickness of sediment. 
So what we look at is how water depth evolves in a succession. And we can then try to interpret whether this is due to changes in accommodation, in sedimentation, or in both. If we are in a continental basin, we don't have a water depth, OK? We have a channel or a floodplain. But what we have is a degree of amalgamation. So if you don't create a lot of accommodation and you keep on sedimenting, your channel cannot, cannot remain always at the same place. So it moves laterally. And so you get an amalgamated sheet, S-H-E-E-T, a sheet, OK, a layer. Um, if you have a lot of accommodation, then your channel will switch around and you will deposit a lot of uh, floodplain. So what we are interested in is how water depth evolves. And this is the um, kind of the um, um, consensus, I would say, or there is some consensus at least, as to how we can symbolize and call uh, and name changes in water depth in a succession. So this is these triangles here and these these little things. They they uh, they are they are like here. They are symbols that we put in a succession. You know, like on this veil type slug here. So if we have a triangle like this we have a progradation. A progradation is when water depth decreases with time. It's shallowing upward. A retrogradation, retrogradation is when you observe deeper and deeper environment on your succession. Let's say you go from continental to deltaic to shelf and to turbidite. You have a superposition of these types of environment. This is a deepening upward succession. And we can say it's retrogradational succession, a retrogradational pattern. If instead you observe shelf sediment, marine, and then deltaic, and then you see fluvial channels uh, coming on top, then you have a progradation. You have a shallowing upward succession. If for 100 meters, you observe no change in depositional environment, like let's say you have the beach all the time, or uh, yeah, swamps or delta, you observe delta, 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 mouth bars, mouth bars, mouth bars. This is called aggradation. Okay, aggradation is pure vertical stacking. Now, there are limits that you can see, boundaries or surfaces, in fact, in three dimensions, that are remarkable, that are key. Uh, and we can find them uh, sometimes on the field and sometimes as well on seismic lines and in logs and cores. So they are remarkable key stratigraphic surfaces. And these are maximum flooding surfaces that are here at the tip of the triangle. So there is a maximum flooding surface when you reach the end of retrogradation and before you start prograding again. Because retrogradation is deepening upward. So you deepen, you deepen, you deepen. And then you start shallowing. So the turnaround time, the turnaround moment when you go from deeper and deeper to shallower and shallower, this turnaround time is the maximum flooding surface. And the maximum flooding surface you see here on this diagram on the, on the veil uh, um, uh, cross section. So you have a low stand system struct and then you start retrograding. That's your transgressive systems tract in green. 
and then you reach a maximum flooding. So there will be a moment where we have a surface. Often there's going to be condensation on this surface because you have maximum depth uh, on it. And so little sediment reach, especially the more distal environment. So you condense, you have a lot of uh, time and very little sediment. And then you start prograding. So you start shallowing. And actually, the, 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 if you think about the situation when you were depositing this strata here, the rest was not deposited. So the surface here is still the maximum flooding surface and it's condensing because nothing comes on it, yet time passes. So uh, this maximum flooding surface is the turnaround time turnaround surface between retrogradation and progradation and it's it's uh, when maximum water depth is reached on the profile or on your section and another important one uh, i didn't put flooding surface here that's the turnaround between progradation and and retrogradation or, or between aggradation and retrogradation fs flooding surface not maximum and there is the sequence boundary the sequence boundary is here, somewhere within progradation. Sometimes it's at the end of the progradation, sometimes it's within progradation. And that depends a little bit on where you are on this profile. But uh, you see the sequence boundary is often an unconformity. And in sequence stratigraphic theory, it's associated with sea level fall. So when we started depositing, when we started this sequence here, the first interval being deposited is this one. And this deposition happens here because sea level at this moment is just here. I should have a line here, okay? Everything above is in erosion. It's these wiggles, these zigzags. And everything below is a correlative conformity of this and we deposit on top of it, on lap, down lap. Okay, so that's the sequence boundary. And at the end of this high stand here, you have again a, a very strong sea level fall and the sea level falls down to here and everything above is exposed and there is erosion. And below we are depositing the next low stand system tract. It's this layer here, down lapping onto the surface. So often the sequence boundary is highly recognizable because it's an unconformity. Okay, there is erosion here and there is onlap onto it. So it's well recognizable. But the maximum flooding surface is also well recognizable because it's a downlap surface. Okay, and often when you look uh, on a stratigraphic section, often it's easier to find the maximum flooding surface because it's a uh, fine grained. Uh, organic rich, uh, they can be uh, also on, on, on some uh, well logs, um, uh, geophysical instruments like gamma ray, it, uh, it gets, it's, uh, it's, it stands out well because of uh, high condensation um, uh, of uh, radioactive elements. So, so the, both surfaces are, are very useful. And they allow us to, to you know, they are markers in the sequence. And they separate the different uh, system tract. Sequence boundary, here there is a flooding surface I didn't discuss. It's the base of the retrogradation. Then there is the maximum flooding surface. That's the base of the high stand. And the sequence boundary, next one, is the top of the high stand, base of low stand. Okay, here, this last piece of uh, this kind of, uh, of, of, of this uh, slide here. This last piece of the slide, you have to, to read this, this, and this together. So what I show here is uh, a stratal pattern of, let's say, fluvial, shoreline, delta, three time steps. What we see here is a progradation. Time one, time two, time three. Do you see that? Do you see what I mean? So it's on a, in, a, in, a, in a cross section, okay? And 
not only it's going seaward, so the, the, this marker here, the, this inflection point is going seaward, so with such a, a shoreline trajectory to the right, to the, towards the sea, but also it's going down. You see my, my, my arrow is going slightly down. So the fact that it's going down means that the beach uh, here at time two is lower in elevation than the beach at time one. And the beach at time three is lower than the beach at time two. And that's a forced regression. To do that, you need to have either a tectonic uplift raising your system or sea level really going down, falling. Okay, and so the, the, the shoreline follows, um, follows the, the, the sea level. Maybe I can do here a small uh, a small um, small web um, web picture uh, raised marine deposits. Mm. I'm maybe not going to find uh, the best. Wait a second. I'm just trying to find the um, Yeah, that's nice. So here it is, and I will do this. And I go here, window, zoom. That's a very nice uh, image, I find. You have a, a cliff. A flat surface here and here what do you see you see a wave cut platform okay so obviously sea level was before here at the bottom of the cliff and it's now down okay so the new shoreline is lower in elevation than the previous shoreline this wave cut platform is a little bit different than than what i was just showing it's really uh, the area over which the waves are where before when the when the shoreline was here is the area where the wave were constantly reworking and eroding um, the bottom, the ground, the sea, the sea, the sea bottom, and they cut such a platform. Okay, but in principle, that's that's the kind of thing we see, and and often. Uh, the change in sea level or the uplift, because you realize that the shoreline was here. You can obtain this, this configuration by either rising the land or lowering the sea. Okay. When I say base level fall, it can be either a tectonic uplift of, of, the, of this area or a real true base level fall, sea level fall. Okay, so back to my um, to my PowerPoint. Um, okay, so this is force progradation, and here I I tell the ratio between A and S. A and S here is less than zero. Okay, to do such a thing you need to decrease accommodation. You need to really have a negative creation of accommodation. Next diagram is, uh, is simply when your shoreline remains at the same level. But since you bring sediment, you are forced to have your uh, shoreline going seaward. 
So this is pure progradation. And in this case, there is no creation of accommodation. Okay, but no destruction either. It's just zero. Therefore, A over S, because A is zero, A over S is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, let's say sea level remains constant and you're thinking about the, the Rhone Delta. The Alps keep on bringing sediment. Okay. If sea level doesn't change, your shoreline is just bound to uh, progress towards the sea. Now, next case. So this is all progradation, you know, this is all this uh, triangle with the, this, this angle down and the base on top. Next case is when the shoreline goes seaward, but also there is a certain amount of vertical accumulation. You see that there is a bit of aggradation and some progradation. You basically have a vector, horizontal vector towards the sea and a vertical vector uh, up, which means in the resulting shoreline trajectory like this, the shoreline goes with a certain angle, okay? It's climbing towards the sea. And this is when there is positive accommodation. So you create accommodation because otherwise you wouldn't be aggrading vertically, but you still have too much sediment for the accommodation you create. Therefore, the, the shoreline is forced to move seaward. Imagine the shoreline uh, in the Rhone Delta again. Let's say sea level rises because of global warming. But let's also say that you bring a lot, a lot, a lot of sediment. Your sea level rises, but since you bring so much sediment, the shoreline is pushed towards the sea. That's normal progradation. Basically, we have progradation here forced by relative sea level fall. This is called forced progradation. A is lower than zero, and A, A over S is also lower than zero. This is no, a pure progradation when there is no aggradation and just a horizontal motion of the shoreline. And this is A equals zero, therefore A over S equals zero. And this is normal progradation. So forced, pure, normal. When A is positive, but lower than S. Therefore, A over S is positive, but less than, less than one. Normal progradation. That's the case, for instance, here. You see at the beginning of the ice stand. Towards the end of the ice stand, it becomes more like pure progradation and at the time of the sequence boundary it becomes forced progradation or forced regression and as you lower the shoreline you actually expose as we've seen on the picture before and you erode you create a sequence boundary now the fourth case there is five cases here the fourth case is pure vertical aggradation So a vertical arrow. This is when A and S are equal. A over S equal one. When there is as much creation of accommodation as there is of sedimentation. And this is aggradation. The system is in kind of a steady state. Okay. You know, whether this exists or not in nature uh, is a question. It probably depends at what scale we are speaking about. Okay, on the long term, you know, million years time scale, I don't think this really exists, but you could argue also it depends what marker you take in your landscape. But environmental factors like climate uh, and with climate, sea level, sediment supply, water discharge, or tectonics. Uh, subsidence, tectonic in the mountain, sediment supply. These factors, they change so much over geological timescales that it's highly unlikely that you reach such a perfect number as one, you know. Equally, it's quite rare you, you, you stay on zero for a long time. 
more probably you're actually oscillating between negative, positive, more than one. Okay. And that's why you have sequences. So A equal one is a gradation. And a gradation uh, only happens uh, in the system uh, at the turnover times between progradation and retrogradation and, and between, to some extent, um, there must be uh, a small time of aggradation uh, between retrogradation and progradation. Yeah, between retrogradation and progradation, you go from more than one and you diminish, diminish, diminish to one, and then you increase again to, to you, 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 you continue decreasing, but you pass by one. So, so this is a gradation. And the last one, the fifth one, is A over S more than one which is more accommodation than sediment supply. So you create more space than you bring uh, sediment. So you can imagine if you continuously increase accommodation, but you don't keep up with enough sedimentation, your water depth increases. Okay? So this is retrogradation. You are deepening upward. You, not you, but the system is deepening upward. So I think this is, um, I don't know how you work, but uh, honestly, I think these kind of diagrams are simple enough to be memorized. And, and uh, I think memorizing uh, pictures like this is easier, especially if they have a logical background uh, and you know what you you know what the red arrow means that it's following the the, the shoreline or this inflection point. Uh, you know this is negative; it's going down. This is equal to zero. It's 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 it has no slope, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think I think this makes a lot of sense, and you can actually remember this as an instant picture, such that you don't have to think about it. And when you are looking at sediment deepening upward you know uh, what's your A over S, you know your retrograding, and you know you expect a progradation afterwards, and you know you should be looking for a certain type of, of, of relationship between accommodation and sediment. It could be due to sediment supply, it could be due to accommodation. Okay? Just to finish on this, the advantage of, of, of using A over S to, as a determinator, determinant, of uh, stratigraphic stratal patterns is that um, it's, it's more general than uh, just using eustasy. Eustasy will change only A, okay? And there will be constant tectonics, constant subsidence, and constant sediment supply. And it's true that with sea level fall, sea level still stand, sea level rising slowly, sea level rising a little faster, and sea level rising very fast, you obtain all of this. But you can also obtain some of this just with sediment supply changing. Not these two, because here you need accommodation. So if accommodation is less than one, less than zero, whatever you do with sediment supply, your ratio is less than zero. Is if accommodation is equal to zero, whatever you do with sediment supply, you have pure progradation, except if you don't have sediment, then nothing happens. But here, accommodation is positive. So with a certain amount of accommodation, let's imagine sea level rise in the Rhone Delta in, uh, on, the, on the southern coast of France. If you bring too much sediment, your shoreline is going to go seaward. And if you bring little sediment, your shoreline is going to retreat landward. Okay, so changing sediment supply can be, can be the responsible factor that drives retrogradation, progradation. Okay, it can be the cause of your sequences. So that's that's one of the um, at least conceptual advantage of using A over S. Um, just an aparté uh, about this. Uh, one of the questions with um, global sea level rise, 
due to melting of ice caps uh, at the poles. One of the questions is whether what's, what is the shoreline going to do? And that's why uh, a lot of people, for instance, uh, Jaya Sivitsky, are very interested in, um, in understanding and um, yeah, estimating, assessing uh, the flux of sediment, the current, the modern sediment flux out of rivers worldwide. Okay. Because with global sea level rise, um, the position of the shoreline is going to be determined by sediment supply. If there is a lot of sediment supply coming out of rivers, then the shoreline could stand, could stay where it is. If there is not much, the shoreline is going to retreat. We know this a lot in France, for instance, in the south of France or in, uh, in the west coast, uh, like in Lacano, uh, close to Bordeaux. Um, it seems that uh, several places actually have the coast retreating because sand is blocked in the rivers with plants, with uh, hydropower plants, dams. Uh, a lot of the sand does not reach the sea as it used to. And so before the sand will go down the Rhone River and it will be then distributed on the coast. You know, you can, you can go in the south, south of Montpellier uh, and the sand there on the beach is a, is, a, is a mixture of many, many different inputs from around uh, the area. But a lot of it comes or used to come from the Alps through the Rhone River and other rivers. Okay, so with sea level rise, it's not, we don't know uh, that the shoreline is going to retreat everywhere on the globe. This is one of the limits of sequence stratigraphy a la Vail. Uh, it's because maybe, you know, in some places in the world, you have progradation and in other places you have retrogradation. So that depends on sediment supply. Okay. Um, I spoke about the dams that uh, kind of trap sediment. Uh, there is also uh, gravel and sand extraction for construction. Okay, uh, you know that in Lake uh, Geneva, for instance, for those of you who are here, and uh, you've seen the barge, you know, this, this, uh, this, um, this little uh, uh, quarry uh, boats uh, on the coast and in front of Montreux there. Uh, extracting the, 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 the gravel and the sand. Um, and you have the same in many, many rivers uh, worldwide because the sand is a, is a sand and, and gravels are a great uh, construction material to mix with, uh, with cement. Um, on the other side, so these are processes that limit the arrival of sand in modern rivers. Um, on the other side, the opposite is uh, the destruction of uh, forests, uh, intensive agriculture, um, global uh, loss of uh, biodiversity and, and plant diversity, um, vegetation change going to more, uh, going to, uh, when, when you change the whole um, uh, vegetation type in an area, all of this can lead uh, to destabilization of soils, okay, such that you bring more sediment into the river. So I, I personally haven't, haven't done enough uh, literature on this to tell you any, any global view of what's going on, but um, I, I imagine it's not so simple to know whether flux is increasing or decreasing and, and what controls it. I, I, I really refer to, I guess, uh, I could find the solution by, by reading more about the, the uh, Sivitsky papers uh, among, among others. All right, I think we've, uh, we've uh, done a good progress on uh, sequence stratigraphy. Um, we have five minutes and so I can start uh, this next uh, slide. So in my plan, if I go back to the initial plan of uh, 
the part that I called that I call terminology and key numbers could be concepts and numbers. Uh, we did from source to sink the succession of three subsystems describing their anatomy, their composition, source transfer deposition, and we have discussed about um, no, we're starting discussing the major processes. Sequence stratigraphy was within here uh, deposition. Okay, so now we go to the major processes: erosion, sediment transport, deposition, and this this is just going to be some elements, and and in a way, uh, how these elements are. Uh, have to be put or can be put in the context of source to sink and uh, environmental signals. So I tried to do a, a planche again by hand of uplift, subsidence, erosion, deposition. So the kind of the links between all of this. Uh, and there's going to be more of processes uh, in this one. But these are the large scale uh, principles that I want you to, uh, to remember and concepts. One very important concept in, in, uh, in source to sink is the concept of the uplift of rocks. Okay. And so when we just say uplift, why, why it's important to, to, to speak about it is because sometimes you only hear about uplift. And, uh, you know, for instance, the Lake Cenozoic uplift of mountain ranges. There is off mountain ranges. So that means uplift of topography. But as you've seen before, you know, as we've discussed before by reading the chicken and egg paper of Peter, of Peter Molnar, uh, the very important, one of the very important teaching of the, the, the um, isostasy uh, figure of Peter Molnar is to learn that there is a big difference between the uplift of rocks and the, um, and the, the surface uplift. Okay. So, we've had a certain amount, the rocks are going up by a certain amount and they are eroded. And there is a resulting surface uplift. Okay. So if you have a uh, six kilometer of uplift and six kilometer of erosion, you actually have um, no surface uplift. Okay, U minus E equals the, the change in elevation. Okay, so this may seem, um, how to say, at, at, at odds with this diagram, it's not. So I'm just coming back because that's important. And I don't want to be confusing. Neither do I want to confuse you, but actually I should, I don't have the diagram in the presentation. I have it only in uh, Mona's paper. Which I will find here. Sorry, uh, here I have the paper by Mona. Um, change chicken and egg. 
Mm, I'm speaking about this figure. Window zoom. Here we have an erosion of delta T. Okay. So we erode six kilometer in the when we described this in the in the course yesterday, we said let's erode six kilometer. And this will result in a delta H of delta T divided by six. So the new H is H minus delta H. Okay, so if we wrote six, we have a delta H of one. Okay, so the change in elevation is one. But the uplift of rocks is five delta t divided by six. So the uplift of rocks is actually less than what has been eroded. So if I come back to this diagram, I should put it actually, um, I should just probably write those numbers here. We have, in the example of uh, Molnar, I don't know why I put an arrow up here, the arrow should be down. In the example of Molnar, I would put five kilometers of rock uplift, six kilometers of erosion makes one kilometer uh, down in the topographic relief. Okay, so let's say your mountain range was four kilometer high. There is five, there, let's say you erode six kilometer. Eroding six kilometer results in five kilometer of uplift and one kilometer of uh, topographic lowering of the main elevation. Okay, so you end up with a range which was four kilometer initially and which is now one kilometer down. Okay. Yes. It's, uh, I hope it's not too confusing, but it's important to have this in mind. Uplift of rock minus erosion gives a uh, surface uplift. DZ over DT is the difference in elevation over a certain amount of time. All right, I suggest to make a small break if you, if you agree, and then we will uh, start again uh, in uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at 2.15. Okay.